Good afternoon. Uh, I'm David Wessel, director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. Thank you for joining us today. Um, unlike the global financial crisis of 2008 and 9, the COVID-19 crisis did not originate in the financial system. In many ways, the COVID crisis has been a stress test of the changes that were made by the government and by the private sector after that crisis. The dysfunction in financial markets was so severe that the Federal Reserve had to intervene with unprecedented force, particularly in the market for US treasuries. So today, the basic question we're gonna address is whether the financial markets, that is the markets for US treasuries, corporate bonds, commercial paper, and so on, amplified the COVID shock. And if so, what actions should we consider to reduce such amplification in the future? At a session next week, uh, the Hutchins Center will take a closer look at how the big banks were affected by and responded to the crisis with a background paper by Jeremy Stein and some co-authors. That's June 4th. We invite you to join that. Today we're going to bring, we have a terrific panel. Today we're going to begin with a presentation of a background paper prepared by Daryl Duffy of the Stanford Business School on the surprising issues that rose, arose in the market for US Treasuries, which is, after all, the deepest and most liquid financial market in the world. Daryl's paper and his slides, as on all the other slides, are posted on our website. Daryl will be followed by E.T. Goldstein of Penn's Wharton School, who will focus on the corporate bond market. Then we'll turn to a market perspective from Beth Hammock, Global Treasurer of Goldman Sachs. And she'll be followed by my colleague at Brookings, Nellie Lang, who is the founding director of the Fed's Financial Stability Division. She's going to comment on the lessons we've learned in the past several months. And when they're done, uh, we'll bring all the presenters back on the virtual stage for a discussion moderated by another of my Brookings colleagues, Don Cohn, the former chair of the Fed's Board of Governors. Um, if you've got questions, uh, you can send them to events at brookings.edu or post them on Twitter at hashtag COVID-19 economy, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So with that, I'd like to turn the stage and the screen over to Daryl Duffy, who's uh, at Stanford. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I'm going to uh, set up my screen. Okay, you should be able to see my title page now. And uh, I've used the provocative title, Still the World's Safe Haven. I'm talking about the US Treasury market and how in March, uh, when news of the COVID crisis struck financial markets, surprisingly, the US Treasury market was no longer the safe haven that it's been known to be in past crises like the 2008 crisis. Instead, the market wobbled quite badly. It became relatively dysfunctional. And as David mentioned in his introduction, the Fed had to step in and basically rescue the market. I wanna review briefly what happened and going forward, what might need to be done in order to put this market on a sounder footing in terms of its design. So first, a very quick review, because time is short today, of what happened and then what to do. Well, first, as I mentioned, the COVID news generated very large liquidation of treasury positions. And my information is that that was coming mainly from large levered hedge funds and foreign investors, among whom I expect are foreign central banks who are managing their foreign exchange reserves. Everyone was going to cash. The flows that were generated by the liquidation of these treasury positions had to get to new ultimate buyers of those treasuries through our current market intermediation system, which is a dealer-based market. And uh, this, March event was like um, pushing an elephant through a small door. The dealer balance sheets, the space for intermediating those flows just wasn't there. And I'll give you some evidence for that. For example, the bid ask spreads that dealers offered to their customers in the treasury market widened by a factor of more than 10. And in the inter-dealer market where dealers trade with each other, and with special liquidity providers, the depth of that market dropped by more than a factor of 10. I'll show you a figure. The US Treasury yield curve, 
the benchmark for the world's interest rates went out of joint. Measures showed that off the run securities became mispriced relative to on the runs and even on the run securities uh, uh, had um, large mispricings. There's a technical called the treasury cash futures basis, which became both a symptom of the problem and in effect, a partial cause of the problem as cash futures basis traders unwound very large positions in that market. And I won't have time to review that today, uh, uh, but it is discussed in uh, the paper that David mentioned that goes with his talk. What did the Fed do? Well, in the largest market operation ever conducted by a central bank and most aggressive, in a matter of merely three weeks, the Fed bought a trillion dollars of treasury securities and continued to buy treasuries at a fast pace. The chair of the Fed said that the purpose of this was to return the market to liquidity. In effect, the Fed was taking supply away from the market so that the market could digest the remaining supply with the existing um, uh, intermediation system, again, the dealer-based market. The Fed also provided unlimited financing for treasuries. It also exempted treasuries from a key, one of its key uh, capital requirements. Going forward, the, uh, I'm gonna show a diagram suggesting that the design of this market is not up to the task um, that it faces with the growing supply of treasuries. Now, this is a complicated diagram. Please give me a minute to go through it. On the vertical axis, the scale shows quantities in trillions of dollars. The timeline goes from 1998 to projected numbers for 2025. In blue is the total marketable supply of US Treasury securities. And in uh, light blue are projected amounts of treasury securities using forecasts of deficits coming from the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. So basically, as you can see, the US uh, government is spending money hand over fist. And as the COVID crisis hit, its commitments to spend money this year, 3.8 trillion in additional deficits, are raising the supply of treasuries to a staggering level that I doubt the current market design is capable of handling without future wobbles like it had in March. Why do I feel that way? The red bars in this diagram show the total balance sheets of the largest US bank holding companies whose names are indicated on the bottom of the slide. As you can see, leading up to the 2008 financial crisis, in the absence of strong capital requirements and strong liquidity requirements, and under the presumption of being too big to fail, these banks expanded their balance sheets at a very rapid pace, tripling in the period shown up to 2008. However, regulators through the Basel process mainly, after the financial crisis, put strong breaks on the appetite of these banks to increase their assets by adding appropriate, stronger capital and liquidity requirements and uh, removing a large part of the uh, presumption of too big to fail, which raised banks' funding costs. As a result, as you can see in red, bank balance sheets did not grow commensurate with the supply of treasuries. Going forward, unless we reduce the reliance on dealer balance sheets for intermediation of this market, I expect more episodes during stress periods when the market will become relatively dysfunctional and the Fed will be forced to do what it did during the initial stages of the COVID crisis. Let me briefly go through a couple of symptoms and then go to one design element and finish my remarks. One of the symptoms of this, as I mentioned, is a widening of bid offer spreads. This diagram is from a speech of Lori Logan, who is the head of the open market trading desk of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, that shows index to 100 at the beginning of the year, 
that bid offer spreads that dealers offered to investors soared in March on these large investor flows. At the same time in the interdealer market, the depth of offers to purchase or sell securities plummeted from typically 175 million available at the inner quotes on the order book to merely 10 or $20 million. Clearly the dealers and other participants in the interdealer market were not making available very much uh, in the way of liquidity to this market. And you can see similar plummeting of depth in London and Tokyo. I'm gonna skip the cash futures treasury. I'm gonna note the exceptionally large growth in flows, that is treasury transaction demands uh, going into the March period. And uh, it's a complicated diagram, but to make a short, uh, to make a long story short, uh, the bars go up a lot in March uh, nearly doubling the total volume of trade. So it's not like the market stopped intermediating, it just became overwhelmed and the additional amount that needed to be intermediated had to go onto the balance sheet of the Fed. And as a general design principle, I would say that we should not rely on the central bank as uh, to step in merely because of the private market is badly designed. We should fix the private market design and the Fed should purchase treasuries as needed for monetary uh, policy reasons and not because of market dysfunctionality. Here briefly is one key element of a reform of this market that I think the government should carefully consider and do a quantitative cost benefit analysis of. And it's a improvement of the current status of central clearing in this market. So let me explain briefly what that is and then how this should be expanded. This is a schematic showing the current system by which buyers and sellers in this market have their trades settled. The customers in blue settle their trades with the dealers shown in green. The dealers on the other hand, when they trade with each other, generally stop relying on each other for performance on the trade settlement but instead novate their positions to a central counterparty, which becomes the buyer to each seller and becomes the seller to each buyer. This has multiple benefits. It reduces counterparty settlement risk, but it also allows dealers to net down their purchases and sales, reducing the amount of balance sheet space and reducing the amount of cash liquidity that they need to continue running this market. Unfortunately, that the, what's shown in this diagram wasn't enough. What I'm proposing, and by the way, the caption of the figure shows that of all treasury transactions, if you're in this market, you are facing the, counter, the central counterparty and only 22% of them. You're facing a bilateral counterparty and non-centrally cleared uh, position on the remaining 77%, which is far too much and has been uh, recommended to be improved by a number of industry groups. Here's what the recommendation is, and then I'll stop. The recommendation is that all active market participants in treasuries should centrally clear their treasuries trades. This has a number of benefits. It improves the ability of the dealers to intermediate the market because it the market then becomes less reliant on dealer balance sheets. It becomes less reliant because more positions are netted purchases against sales, reducing balance sheet space for the dealers. And it also allows at least for the possibility going forward that non-dealers could trade directly with each other. That is, uh, let's say an insurance company and a hedge fund in principle could trade with each other. Now that's not this proposal. That's a possibility that could become a reality if there existed a central counterparty and if all trades were mandated. I do not think this is gonna happen merely from uh, private market participants getting together and making it happen on their own. I do think this is going to require an official sector mandate similar to the one that was brought into the interest rate swaps market after the last financial crisis in the Dodd-Frank Act. That mandate has 
now brought the vast majority of swaps into clearinghouses, improving transparency, lowering counterparty risk, and improving market pricing. So with that, I'm going to pass the baton because I am now out of time uh, to Professor Goldstein. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Daryl and uh, David. Let me now share my screen. Do you see my slides? Yeah, good. Okay, so what I will talk about is the corporate bond market um, and how it did uh, during this COVID-19 crisis. And in particular, what I think is a very important feature of the corporate bond market, and this is the investment funds who are active in it uh, and are prone to fragility. So let me give you some uh, background. Investment funds, including mutual funds and ETFs, became a dominant force in the corporate bond market since the global financial crisis of 2008-2009. In previous papers, uh, I've written about uh, this and, and the fact that those funds um, have liquidity mismatch. They hold illiquid assets, but they are uh, offering investors the ability to redeem money on a frequent basis. And as a result, they offer a high level of liquidity to their investors. Because of this liquidity mismatch, they are prone to some type of run uh, be behavior. And over the last years, this has been uh, a focus of uh, policy. Uh, it has been a major concerns uh, among policymakers leading to changes in laws in recent years. Uh, for example, uh, a leading example is that the SEC here in the United States allowed swing pricing in the United States uh, for mutual funds uh, starting November 2018. And I will come back to that uh, at the end. So I think this is now a good opportunity, as David said in the beginning, to look at what happened in this market. In some sense, the COVID-19 crisis is a major stress test, and we want to see how this market uh, failed uh, during this uh, episode. Um, so in the last few weeks, I, I looked at uh, some of, of the data together with uh, Antonio Falato, who has been working on related issues with Ali uh, Otaksu. We have uh, daily data on uh, flows into mutual funds and out of mutual funds. And we looked at what happened uh, during this uh, recent uh, period. And we found some very interesting findings and I will uh, go through them uh, quickly. Let me just give you the, the highlights. Um, corporate bond markets in the United States suffered severe stress in March uh, 2020. I think it's very clear. Uh, it led to a dramatic increase in spread and a decrease in liquidity. If you look at what happened to the investment funds in the corporate bond uh, market, uh, they experienced massive outflows, which are far greater than anything we have seen uh, in, in the last years. Okay, so that definitely far greater than anything we have seen since they became such a, a major uh, player in the market. Uh, the flows were unusual in many dimensions. Uh, they were sustained over a few weeks, uh, persistent. Uh, there are some interesting things about the timing regarding where it started, what type of funds it started with, and where it continued to, and I will briefly go over this. What, what we see is that the thing that really helped um, alleviate the, the stress uh, was uh, policy intervention from the Fed. And I think this echoes some of what uh, Darrell said in a different context. Um, in particular, in March 23rd, uh, the Fed announced uh, through two facilities that they will start purchasing investment grade bonds on primary and secondary markets. In April 9, they extended the amount substantially and also announced that they will uh, acquire some of the uh, junk bonds, uh, so-called fallen angels, those that were investment grade and were downgraded. And, and we think this uh, went a long way towards alleviating uh, the stress 
uh, in, in this market. So let me brief you, take you through some of the, of, of the trends. Um, what you see here in this graph is the growing prominence of investment funds in corporate bond markets over the years. And, and you see uh, the trend since uh, 2010 until uh, 2020. You see that nowadays, if you take the total net asset value of um, mutual funds and ETFs investing in corporate bonds and divided by the market size, it's almost uh, 0.4. Okay, so it's almost 40% in, in size. You know, it was less than 20% in 2010, and it was even lower than that before the financial crisis. Uh, so it's not something that we can ignore. This is a major player in the corporate bond market. What you see in those two pictures is the major stress that this market uh, experienced during the COVID-19 uh, crisis with a spike in spreads, uh, both high yield and investment grade. Obviously, the levels are different between high yield and investment grade, uh, but um, the, the, the overall spike is, is similar. Okay, and you can see how uh, the uh, uh, spread increased uh, before the announcement of Fed intervention and then uh, slowly decreased in, in both of them. Here you can see a perspective, a long run perspective of uh, flows. Uh, and these are monthly aggregate net flows uh, for corporate bond funds and ETFs in the corporate bond market over the last uh, decade. And you see very quickly how the recent event, uh, how extreme it is relative to anything we have seen in that market over the last uh, decade. So what you see here are basically aggregate outflows in March and April um, um, in, uh, in 2020. Uh, you, you know, the previous time where we saw something close to that was the taper tantrum here in 2013, uh, but what we see here is, is, much, is much bigger. Uh, another perspective that uh, shows you even more how extreme uh, things uh, were is to look at how broad uh, the shock was, how many funds uh, experienced uh, stress. And basically what you can see here is the daily net fraction of funds with large uh, top decile outflows. And you can see that this is really unprecedented what we saw in the recent uh, couple of months. Okay, so by the way, here negatives will mean inflows and positives will mean outflows. So you can see the outflows are really uh, extreme. Another perspective is to think about persistence. Um, you know, funds start worrying when they see outflows over more than one day, two days, three days. So we just picked looking at uh, funds experiencing um, extreme outflows, uh, top decile outflows in two consecutive days. And again, you can see that what we saw in the last couple of months is truly unprecedented, okay? So, so this is sort of an aggregate view of what happened in total in March and April. Um, I think uh, to get a better understanding, what we wanna do is we wanna look at the evolution of flows over this period. And you can see here uh, the evolution over this period. And again, we highlight the March 23rd policy announcement and the April 9 uh, policy uh, announcement. Uh, to just give, give you a feel of what role they played in uh, alleviating the stress. But you can basically see major outflows um, during the month of, of March, um, continuing after the first policy announcement, uh, and, and basically things stabilize uh, slightly before the second policy announcement and continue to stabilize after that. Okay. Um, if you're interested in the different types of funds, um, you can see here a breakdown into high yield funds versus investment grade funds versus ETFs. And I think what is interesting to highlight here is we saw uh, signs of stress first in the high yield funds, which is maybe what we should expect. And they experienced severe outflows uh, for a while. Um, the investment grade funds continued after that, even when things started reversing in the high yield funds. Okay. And again, things come down after the second policy announcement. 
Another interesting perspective is to compare the illiquid funds versus the liquid funds, uh, because of what I said in the beginning, the liquidity mismatch, I think is an important part of the story, something that we would like to look at. And again, you can see here something that is rather similar to what I said with high yield versus investment grade, whereby the illiquid funds started so showing signs of stress first, uh, and uh, the liquid funds uh, followed after that. So all in all, uh, what do we take from it? I think we can see clearly that investment funds uh, became a dominant player in corporate bond markets. Um, as I mentioned, I believe that they're prone to fragility. There has been other research on it. I worked on it before uh, and uh, it has been a focus of uh, policies uh, over the last uh, few years. Um, the COVID-19 crisis imposed severe stress on them, uh, leading to massive outflows. And uh, from initial inspection of the trends over the last couple of months, I think it is fair to say that the massive intervention by the Federal Reserve was important in order to alleviate the problem. Going forward, we probably should not count on such intervention every time there is stress in the market. So we should probably ask, what should we do? Uh, so that these fragilities in the system do not uh, persist. Uh, you know, possible policies are basically designed to reduce the liquidity mismatch. And this can be done either by improving the liquidity of the underlying corporate bond assets, uh, for example, by trying to transfer those assets into centralized markets rather than decentralized markets. Or another way is to reduce the liquidity that is available to investors investing in corporate bond funds. One way to do it is via swing pricing, where essentially when you have large outflows, this will be reflected in the net asset value that investors can, uh, can get. Um, swing pricing was introduced in the US in 2018, but is still very uh, rarely uh, adopted. I think funds are sort of still figuring their way uh, around it. Uh, but from evidence we have from other countries, it has been uh, effective in alleviating uh, stress. Uh, so this is something to, to look for uh, in the future. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. And I will move it over to Beth. Thanks, Ite. Um, so I'll give a perspective from a market practitioner uh, in terms of what happened from the banking system's perspective. And I think both, both Daryl and Ite spoke really well about some of the stresses that we saw in the system uh, in the financial markets and how that played out. But when I think about it from, from where we sit um, and what happened in the COVID-19 crisis, you know, we had a, a pretty tremendous amount of strain on the system the, of the, the broad economy in that you had global, consum global consumer spending fall very rapidly and almost instantaneously. And with the, with the shelter in place orders that happened throughout uh, the country, and companies reacted very rationally by trying to draw on their credit facilities that they had lined up, furloughing employees, cutting expenses wherever possible, and that created a cash shortfall overall. Now, typically I would say, we think about drawing on these types of corporate facilities as having real negative stigma, but certainly in March, there was a moment where if you were a corporate treasurer, you seemed to be um, you know, almost negligent if you weren't drawing on those facilities. And so that put a strain on the, the banking system as well as on the, the corporate bond markets. Um, you know, we saw that through that period, liquidity at the banks dropped. The low point in reserves in March was around $1.4 trillion, which is very similar to the lower bound of reserves that we'd seen last September uh, when we saw a lot of strains come through in the repo markets. You know, this, this lower access to interday cash coincided with greater needs for cash by participants in the economy overall. And when cash is dear, you sell what you can, which may not necessarily be what you want. And so you did see a lot of selling in the treasury market, even though treasuries are, I would still argue the safest and most liquid asset, uh, because when you have that type of strain, that's the thing for which you can still find a bid. Now, it's important to note that the speed of this move was very rapid and highly compressed relative to what we saw in 2008. Uh, by some measures, you can see it being almost 10 times uh, the speed of which some of the deterioration we saw in the market. And you have to remember that for most of the financial market participants, this was all happening as they were moving to running their operations from their homes 
rather than large trading floors uh, across the globe. And so you had a lot of frictions, particularly in those couple weeks in March, that were not just normal market frictions, but were really logistical operational type frictions that were coming into being. So the Fed immediately implemented you know, a significant number of programs, a lot of the programs that we saw in 2008. Um, they put their balance sheet out there and they, they really helped to fix, I think, a lot of the strains that were going through the system. And while we would agree that private markets should be able to operate without this type of support from the Federal Reserve Bank, extraordinary times do call for extraordinary measures. And we, we do applaud the efforts that the Fed put in place uh, to, help, to help manage this. You know, what I'll say is coming out of the global financial crisis, I think a lot of the rules and regulations that were put in place helped to make this particular crisis a more muted one than what we saw in that, in that episode. And so with the exception of the leverage rules, I'll say, I think the rules that were put in place post the global financial crisis have largely worked. I think there will continue to be some adjustments and some review of if everything operated the way that uh, policymakers would have expected. Uh, but I think the fact that the banking system entered this crisis with much deeper pools of capital and much more ample liquidity has really allowed the banking system to help get the real economy back on its feet and to act as a bridge from the financial markets to the, the real economy markets. I, I will say that I think this, um, you know, one of the areas of regulation that I think will come under more, uh, more scrutiny or, or, or certainly more review will certainly be the liquidity rules that were put in place. Um, the, the capital rules that exist and certainly with the new capital regime for the stressed capital buffer that the Fed's just announced do contemplate using buffers and think about buffers being more explicit. When you look at the liquidity rules, you really don't have that same concept of having a buffer that can be dipped into. And so you end up having a lot of pro-cyclicality in that banks need to enter a strain like this with a lot of liquidity, but then need to keep replenishing it through every step of the, of the way. Um, so I'll talk for a minute about, you know, our treasury is a liquid asset. And yes, I still very much believe that treasuries are a very liquid asset. Uh, I think they are, are certainly a largely um, safe asset and safe haven. Uh, but I think what we find is that in a liquidity crisis, funding and leverage becomes very scarce. And certainly some of the regulatory reforms, particularly the leverage rules that were put in place, um, have, have really limited the banks and the dealers' capacity to provide their balance sheets both to, uh, to cash participation as well as to funding. And so you do see some more strains that come in the marketplace. Now you've seen those types of, of strains come in the market um, and you've seen those leverage rules happen at the same time as you've seen treasury issuance explode. So it exploded coming out of 2008, 2009. You, you had treasury outstandings triple since that period. And we're going through another period right now where you're gonna see tremendous growth in treasuries outstanding. I think what we've seen and, and what Daryl talked about is that the, the marginal buyer of treasuries, as we've seen, has, has largely been a levered buyer, someone who needs some financing attached to that. And so if you have more constraints on the banking system about their ability to provide that leverage, it's going to make it more and more difficult for that, those buyers to, to find their ultimate home. And so there are a couple of um, different uh, ways that that can, that can um, you know, play through and resolve itself. One is, I do think that central clearing of repo rather than cash treasuries is a possibility and, and, and that may help alleviate some of these issues. It's important to note that we do have central clearing today, although it's for a limited subset of the market participants, not for everyone. Some of the regulatory relief, either on leverage or on holding of treasuries uh, and possibly treasury repo as well is another possibility that could help alleviate some of this issue. And you've seen the Fed move through the, uh, the supplementary leverage relief, both at the holding companies and at the bank entities to provide some of that to help encourage uh, broader, broader holdings of treasuries. And the last one is that you could see treasury yields rise. Um, you could see them price higher through this, through this period. Um, and that would, I think, also help them to find more homes for, for longer, term, longer term buyers. Um, and so, you know, I, I will say that as, as we looked at you know, what happened here, and as you saw reserves drop in the system initially, the Fed has really supplied the system with a tremendous amount of liquidity, both through their, their purchases, through the repo operations. And when we look at the various waves of liquidity that, that the Fed has put in place, I think you saw it really in three different steps. One was the 2008 playbook, increasing the money supply, but doing it for institutions that have sufficient liquidity 
and can really weather the storm. And so you saw things like the purchases, like the, the term uh, access to the discount window, the primary delay credit facility, the money market liquidity facility and, and commercial paper facilities. Those really helped to get uh, the high quality part of the market restarted. The second wave was really around getting the broader credit market started. And so that was the primary market corporate credit facility, the secondary market corporate credit facility, and the use of, of ETF purchases to help, help start the economy there. And then I think the third wave will hopefully get more at some of the real economy rather than just the financial economy and trying to get the velocity of money through the system restarted. And so that's things like the TALF, the Main Street Lending Facilities, um, and the, the Paycheck Protection Program and, and, and funding facilities for that. And that will help, uh, help help take that forward. So I think, you know, while it is, it's good to see that we've made some repairs, I think there still is a bit of a disconnect as I look at it between what's happening in the financial economy and where you see markets and markets forward looking views versus what we still have yet to play out in the real economy with unemployment rates skyrocketing and needing to get some repair really going back into that uh, into that Main Street area. So maybe I'll, I'll stop my comments there uh, and turn it over to Nelly. Okay, thank you, Beth. Um, I am going to um, put up some, a couple of slides just to illustrate. So, um, there's actually already been a rich set of issues that have been introduced, and so I don't want to add too much more, um, but I do want to make a couple comments about liquidity, I think, and financial markets. Um, I think the events that we've seen and how th markets have played out suggest the demand for liquidity is very real. It materializes um, in stress periods and the provision of liquidity doesn't always show up when it's most needed. Um, so let me just illustrate that with a couple of points. Um, over the past couple of decades, you, there's always been a demand for liquidity, especially in stress periods. There aren't that many financial products that can actually offer immediate liquidity. Uh, cash is one. Treasuries, at least until Daryl told me it wasn't, um, I always thought was one. And I think, you know, the Securities and Exchange Commission and most regulators would call treasuries a highly liquid asset. Um, but, but the demand for liquidity has been increasing and more products have been created to offer more liquidity on demand. Um, and many of these products I think have gotten quite big relative to the kind of backstops or internal backstops to provide this liquidity. And I would also comment that many of them seem to be kind of quite homogeneous so that when they run into liquidity problems, they're going into correlated and crowded trades. And in some sense, this is where Daryl started us off in treasury markets. Um, but I'm gonna try to um, just illustrate quickly um, this point that the demand for liquidity is real in two points, money market funds, and then, and then just one more point on corporate bonds building off of what Ite showed. Um, I think in the end, we, what we want to do is tee up the questions for future research um, and future events about how do you create these products to offer liquidity? How should they be paid for ex ante so that it's not the Federal Reserve, or in this case, it's the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and the government stepping in to be the backstop. Um, so my first chart is from the, um, let's see if I can get this right, is from the uh, Federal Reserve Board's recent financial stability report. And it's just the chart of inflows, outflows, net flows to institutional prime money market funds. And you can see in March as word and fears about COVID-19 were increasing the redemptions were 
starting to accelerate. And um, whoops, I apologize. Sorry about that. I'm hitting the wrong button. Um, now, this is market participants say that the reason these redemptions were accelerating is because there is now a 30% limit on liquid asset holdings. And this is a new 30% limit on liquid asset holdings that was not in place in 2008. It was part of the 2014 reforms. And it's basically if a fund's liquid assets, which are basically cash and securities, falls to 30%, the board of directors of the fund have to make some decisions about either imposing a redemption fee of roughly 2% or, or roughly, or gating, which, um, which is basically um, suspending redemptions for up to 10 days. Well, as again, as market participants tell the story, as funds got closer to this 30% limit, um, um, withdrawals accelerated. So this is just the plain investor run dynamic. And um, now there hasn't been research that I have seen that has come out of the SEC or the Fed or other researchers yet on whether the flows were the strongest at the funds that are closest to this 30%. But I expect that will come because these kind of data do become available um, within a month or two after the events. And so um, that will be important for reforms. But it's important to, to illustrate one is the prime money funds no longer have the fixed NAV, which was the problem in which was a one of the problems in the 2008 crisis where investors were concerned about whether these funds would break the buck. Now it's a gate. It's a gate that threatens to close when redemptions are increasing and liquid assets are falling. Um, so in some sense, it's an accelerant. Um, the point of this is the demand for liquidity is very real. Um, it, and the Fed, as you know, stepped in here, which I'll mention in another minute. Okay. Um, the second chart I'm just gonna that I want to use to illustrate is um, Ellie. If I can interrupt, can you go to full screen? Oh, am I not on full screen? No. Sorry about that. Does that get you there? Yes, thanks. Okay, sorry about that. I wasn't sure what I was. Uh, um, okay, so the next point is, this is just building off of ETA. This is, um, and Daryl's points that liquidity in what are viewed as very liquid markets can sometimes disappear. So this is investment grade corporate bonds. Um, this is a recent paper put out by um, Hadid Marrera Muir, the MBER paper, and using trace data through the end of March, which tracks the corporate bonds, they were able to document a few um, interesting points that that sort of will be part of discussions about what, um, if anything, needs to be done. So I'm going to start with the panel A, which is on the right side. Um, and this is just an ETF and a mutual fund offered by Vanguard. And the ETF tracks the same bonds as what are in the mutual fund. But you can see the ETF price falls below the value of the mutual fund. And this is when the levered investors are selling treasuries, they're selling investment grade corporate bonds, they're also selling investment grade corporate ETFs. So this, you can see this discrepancy, this, this gap between um, the NAV of the fund and the price of the ETF is historically pretty large. On the left side, you can, this is a chart that looks at the change in the CDS spread along the horizontal axis and the change in the bond spread on the vertical axis for the same bond. So these are bonds that are in a traded ETF and the on the run CDS indexes, roughly four to six years maturity. So the orange dots are the high yield sector. 
So normally in investment grade corporates, if you think this is just a credit risk issue, the high yield sector is going to be the first to feel the stresses. And you can see the, the diagonal line is a 45 degree line. And what happens here with the orange dots is high yield bonds, the CDS rise, and the bond spreads rise. And they kind of match the 45 degree line. The blue dots are the investment grade. And CDS doesn't increase that much for many of them, but the increase in bond spreads is pretty big. And again, this is reflecting sort of new liquidity premia and um, the, the need for cash in an unlevering. So um, just adding to uh, Ite's discussions. Okay, so what did the Fed have to do here? So I think I agree with Beth. Um, extraordinary times require extraordinary actions. Um, Federal Reserve board, Federal Reserve system is lender of last resort. Um, first, they open the money market mutual fund liquidity facility, which lends to dealers based on the collateral that they purchase from money market funds. And this is including this this time commercial paper and short term municipal securities. There is $10 billion of credit protection from the Treasury. Also, it is a 13-3 facility and does need approval needs to be done in coordination with Treasury. So the Fed can lend, but it does require sort of broad government cooperation. Um, it did resolve the issues in the money fund um, sector. So importantly, supported the stability of short-term funding markets. The corporate credit facilities are very new and a very big step, and I think are brought on in part because of um, not just credit quality concerns, but liquidity demands. And that's what I wanted to make my point. One, and I would also highlight the last bullet point, $75 billion of equity is required from Treasury here. So this is not simply a Federal Reserve facility. Um, now the PM, the primary market and secondary market facilities are designed to work together to improve the provision of credit ultimately to companies. Um, now there are high secondary market, and the idea is that if secondary market yields are super high, that increases the borrowing cost to companies because seasoned bonds compete with the newly issued bonds. So the secondary market will buy shares in exchange traded ETFs, which can provide quick and broad support to the market. And one of the features of the features of the ETFs that help them is ETFs are exempt from the CARES Act and the conflict of interest and all the certification process. So it's a quick way and it's a broad way to support the market. I think though, the lesson from this episode is not so much that ETFs um, are, are liquid and provide liquidity. I think we also wanna think about the extent to which ETFs and their dynamics affect the mutual funds and the underlying corporate bonds. Um, and then I would just make my last point where the PMCCF and CSMCCF were expanded to companies that were downgraded recently. I think in the investment management industry, there's a big gap, there's a big line between what is an investment grade and what is high yield. And when you fall, that there's, it's almost like a cliff effect. And I think they were trying to smooth some of that. And so that was an element of that, um, which again is reflecting some of the market practices and not so much the underlying credit um, quality. Okay, and so I will stop with that. Okay, and I'm gonna turn it over to um, Don who will lead us off in our next part. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.